Coffee and food in general, right? These are things that yeah. are very different from person to person. Like physiologically, people can have such different reactions. And you just, to some extent, like you're saying, you have to accept the fact that your body does not process it like mine does. Therefore, you can have a lot less of it and I can enjoy that thing more. But then there's other things that you can have a lot more of that I can't have more of. And that's just about learning your own body Absolutely. as you, you know, age and experiment with things. What do you think about that concept in terms of like the emotional side of life? Like, is there a truth to that as well? Like some people could, can handle stress or pressure better than others or some people, and this is like just as a baseline, yeah. like a physiology, some people can handle um, like giving and receiving more love and things like that. Like, what's your thoughts on that? It's a mixture of, like you said, the emotional side and the physical side, right? There's always going, it's it's never just one or the other. It's always going to be a combination and a compilation of these two, but also several other factors that are going to be so individual to us, right? We can go as far as ancestral uh, predispositions, genetic predispositions for people that would really want to go far out there that believe in reincarnation. You can go to past life stories and what you chose to come into experience in this life. So we can go as far as we want to with this, but to bring it back to the physical experience here in Earth, as we speak right now, the physiology will definitely determine how you handle certain foods, coffee, alcohol, whatever it might be, anything, even simple things like seemingly simple things like herbal teas a lot of people don't actually understand the power of herbs or just think well it's just a herbal tea and of course it depends on the quality of the herbs that are being used in the tea and the bioavailability of it where it was sourced from so it could be more or less potent but even the tea i was talking to you about the mint with citrus right i've got the same brand lemon balm with a bit of cherry um, aroma in that and we're in poland right now so the names are in polish and it's called Melissa. Melissa is the name of the herb. And I just didn't put the two together that it's lemon balm in English. And Cliff drank that tea and he was like, what is that tea actually? Like what herb is it? And I'm like, well, Melissa, I thought Melissa is Melissa also in English. So he looked that up and realized it was lemon balm because it didn't make him feel great at all. And he didn't know why. So herbs can very powerfully push your immune system response one way or the other. Cliff always talks about there's two sides of our immune system. It's like a seesaw, right? And one is responsible for more acute stuff and the other for more chronic stuff. Let's not get into details because that's his area of genius, right? But from even the basic understanding, if you're dominant on one side, this is a, one of the tests that we often use with clients as well. You can use certain her herbal concoctions like teas and, and infusions to see what side of the immune system we have to work with a client without having to do expensive testing, for example. So if finances are a, a limit for someone and we've got another type of test that we want to run to determine what's going on with them and to create the best path for them, we don't necessarily have to test the, the immune um, dominance for them in that case because we can use very powerful herbs which is a form of testing so he realized that he just can't even though he enjoyed that tea, he can't really drink it because it doesn't make him feel that great because it pushes his immune system to to the, the wrong side if you like right so we've got physiological predispositions that will definitely determine of how we break down um stuff that that we're eating or drinking and it could be just more of a setup, a genetic setup and the expression, but then also our environment is influencing that as well. So, for example, we talked a lot about the, the mold infection, the mold story or move from Cyprus to Poland to heal and, and all of that stuff. Um, right now, I, I love wine. You know how much I love wine and I love wine for the purpose of learning about it. I'm just fascinated by anything to do with wine. And, you know, I started more serious studies last year and I did two levels of the, um, the course that I'm doing. There's another two levels that I want to do. But like right now, I can't even taste, let alone drink and actually enjoy a glass. Most of the time when you're studying, you're taking a sip, you swirl it around your mouth and you spit most of it. Right. And that's how you test taste uh, when you're studying. 
I can't even really do that because you're still absorbing some of that alcohol through through your mouth, right? And it just doesn't make me feel great. My body is so compromised right now physiologically that I get to be really mindful and careful in terms of what I eat and what I drink. But when my body is fully functioning, doesn't have the infection that's going on in it right now, is balanced, my gut is healthy, I don't need to worry about it so much. I'm aware of the fact that if I drink a whole bottle, it's probably not a good idea because my body is not going to respond to it. Well, really, truly, alcohol is always going to be toxic to our body, right? But I can enjoy a glass and enjoy it with a nice meal and not really feel like I had any alcohol at all. So we've got the predisposition, the makeup of us, how we made, and that comes from our ancestry and so on and so forth. Then we've got the, the immediate things that are affecting us in our environment at the time. But then we also have the whole emotional side and mental side as well, how we approach it, what our connections are to the food or drink that we're consuming. Are we going down the route of an emotional connection that takes us to a memory of some sort? Um, you know, a pleasant memory from childhood or something like that. Is it a, uh, like my dad, for example, when he was still here, he would not eat chicken because as a kid, he was forced to eat chicken. So even if he had chicken, it would not make him feel great because he was bringing back memories of his grandma, my great grandma, telling him how good chicken and white meat was for him and that he had to eat it even though he didn't enjoy it, right? So you've got that aspect there as well. So whether it brings good or bad in your eyes, uh, memories, but then also how our nervous system responds to that. Because when we get to hypersensitivity, our limbic system just starts to react to everything, which is the, the threat recognition mechanism, the primal part of our brain, mm -hmm where we're learning every second, every moment, we assessing what's safe, what's not based on our, our previous experiences. So when we get to a point where um, our immune system is compromised, there might be an infection going on, there might be a hugely stressful period going on in our lives, more on the emotional side rather than physical, your body is still recognizing it as a stress stressor that it needs to deal with. And it can get to a point of, of a level of confusion within our system that it's going to start and want to attack everything because everything is perceived as a threat. And as an example for that, um, while we were preparing ourselves for the, the protocols and the healing um, that we're doing right now to, to get rid of the mold, and we had some food testing done. We, again, that's Cliff's area of genius. Most food sensitivity testing is shit just because of the methodology and the, the science behind it and the techniques that they use. Um, but like I said, he can... He can talk to you more about that if you want to. But the test that we did, um, test, I think, about 140 different foods or something like that. And Cliff came up reactive for over 100. And is th there is a question. A lot of people, without even going into the quality of the testing itself, a lot of people won't understand it and the practitioners won't have the capacity and the knowledge to unfortunately explain it either that this isn't a true representation because of everything that's going on. Like what I was talking about with wine, me not being able to have it right now, right? Because of what's going on in the body, that's not a true representation. His body is so compromised because of the mold exposure um, from the house that we were living in um, that his body is confusing most of the foods that he's eating for a threat. So, you know, that's, I could keep going. But knowing that it depends on so many different factors on how we react and respond to what we eat um, and what we drink. And then knowing that there is other than, for example, our immune system being compromised, a gut not being in the greatest health and us then coming up for hundred and something foods, right? As reactive, we can then do a lot of stuff to turn it around and, and get the opposite effect where our bodies can adapt themselves to tolerating so much more again that you can retrain your nervous system for your body to start trusting your choices so much more than do the physical, physiological healing, understand our emotional connection to food as well. If there's any binges, like cravings, comfort food patterns for people when you understand where it's coming from, you liberate yourself from it. And it doesn't mean you exclude these things forever, but you choose them consciously. If you want a little bit of chocolate that used to be a no-go for you because you knew if you had a bite, you would have the whole block or maybe like three or four bars at the time. That doesn't happen anymore because it's nonsensical to your brain and your subconscious mind to process that as that compulsion. You don't need to do that anymore. And you're at peace with the fact that if you want a piece of chocolate, 
you might have it and you won't feel guilty after having it because you've had a couple of pieces rather than the whole bar, for example. So it's such a vast subject, but you can tell that's one of my favorites in the work that we've been doing for years with our clients because, you know, working on the physical health and bringing the emotions to it and the body and mind connection, you have to tap into the emotional attachment to food because if you don't, people are going to end up going around in circles very often because every single one of our reactions to food and habits and patterns around food, they're always connected to our emotions. It doesn't matter if someone loves chicken and broccoli and say sweet potato, whatever that might be perceived as a super healthy meal, someone will have a preference on sweet potato versus white potato based on their emotions or spinach versus bro broccoli. Why do you prefer one than the other? There's going to be some sort of emotional attachment to that. It doesn't only go to binging and comfort food and cake and chocolate and alcohol. Yeah, fascinating. I love that yeah. you just explained that there's like a gradient for all of those things. Absolutely. And I think what you yeah, what you're saying is like some things are on the extreme end of that gradient, but everything is on that gradient. Yeah. Everything. So then let me ask you How did you get started in this entire like world of what it is you've been doing? Mm. Like what was the beginning? What was like the the catalyst? It's okay to swear, right? Oh, of course. <laughs> I prefer to ask because I simply honor you and the audience, right? But it just falls out of my mouth because... I, I really am excited about this story because you set that context. Yeah, exactly right. And I'll tell you why. Because I appreciate, you know, I'll get to the story in just a second. But I think it's important to mention that just like interpretation of different foods and the stories attached to it, there is also interpretation of language in different words. Like, why do we consider fuck to be a shit word and rainbow to be a pleasant word? We just we were taught that. Right. And I remember uh, this rock band in Poland from like, I don't know, the 70s, the 80s and the, the front man, the leader would say in an interview, he said, you know what, if I'm fucked off, I'm gonna say I'm fucked off with someone or with myself or something. He said, I'm not gonna just say I'm mildly irate or you know, something like that. I can't remember the exact <laughs> That's word. That's very I'm not British say, to do that. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it is, I lived in no the UK Brits. for a long time. No, <laughs> they know it. Most of Brits laugh at it anyway and the one behind the wall he's a very different Brit anyway to most Brits <laughs> he doesn't follow the <laughs> uh, paradigms but anyway and stereotypes but going back to the story of how this started the beginning of all this was the fact that and I didn't realize this for a, for a while it was that I personally and Cliff we were both fucked <laughs> that's why I asked if it's okay to swear because we were fucked different ways personally individually but we didn't even know each other at the time so I was working it was 2009 I was working in corporate recruitment and um, I, I won't say that I hated it but I knew deep down I was just going to the office because it was a job you know it was just something to do and my manager at the time loved me and she wanted, I was working with administration within the administration area. And I was also working with the candidates. I wasn't working with working with the clients that were giving us the job positions to be filled. I was working with the candidates, actually helping them write their CVs, helping them prepare for um, the interviews. And I didn't even know what I was doing at the time. I was just helping them be themselves and trust themselves most really, um, which was amazing and rewarding. But the manager really wanted me to become a consultant and a salesperson. I was just like, that. that is not happening. I am not going to be Called calling different companies, asking if they have jobs. I'm not going to be running around the city of London because that's where I worked, asking people for positions and all of, all of that stuff that completely didn't resonate with me. And I'm glad that even at that time, without any of the knowledge and awareness that I've got right now, I honored myself. But because of her trust in me, she was really, truly the person, the first person in my life that I felt saw me and appreciated me for what I was doing, which was amazing. Um, and it helped me really look deeper into myself and actually what it is that I want to do. And I started training in the gym and going to the gym and looking after myself from a more of the physical perspective in 2000 and 
five. Like I was active before, like I used to love ice skating. I still do and actually came back to it a couple of weeks ago when we returned to Poland, which is awesome. Even though I'm only five foot, it, I was playing basketball and not professionally or in a school team because no one would let me. But I loved it. So I was active, but not to that degree and that extent. And in 2005, a year after I moved to the UK, I started training in the gym and I just, I really got into it. I got really passionate. I started exploring and I really felt and saw my body change profoundly, but internally something wasn't quite adding up. And um, understanding that in on reflection a lot more now, I thought it was mostly emotional um, I was depressed and becoming more and more depressed month on month and I was having panic attacks out of seemingly nowhere. All the stress from work during the week, I would return home on a Friday and either on a Friday night or on a Saturday morning, it almost was like a ritual in the end, a routine, I would have a panic attack because I didn't know how else to release that stress. And um, there was all sorts of other stuff going on and I eventually ended up with what I could now describe as some sort of level of chronic fatigue in one way or another, because I was living a 15 minute walk from my office, beautiful stroll through Covent Garden in London for whoever mm. knows Covent Garden. It's just lovely, right? Beautiful. Every morning it was just lovely. And I could not walk for 15 minutes to get into work without having to sit down on a bench. And I was in my early twenties at the time. I would have been mid twenties around that. And it was just horrendous and I was living on energy drinks, Lucozade, didn't enjoy Red Bull that much, but sometimes Red Bull. And every afternoon I would have, and listen to this, a skinny, sugar-free vanilla latte from Starbucks. I can't even drink that shit now. <laughs> it's disgusting. <laughs> Apologies to those that still enjoy it. I just can't even. Once I learned a bit more about coffee, I'm just like, oh, anyway. Uh, so I was fueling myself on that, just not knowing any different, right? So training in the gym and learning more about my body, probably not fueling myself with my nutrition that well, but also the stress from work and the physiological stuff. I realized a couple of years later that I had a parasite, that my gut wasn't functioning really well, all sorts of stuff was going on that I needed to address. So all of that was, again, right, the whole spectrum and gradient, all of that was contributing to how I was feeling. So I started exploring and I remember a couple of my friends talking to me about just the fact of how passionate I am in the gym, like teaching them stuff and helping them do what they needed to do while they had no clue. And something just dawned on me. I was like, how cool would that be to actually really get into it and teach people? So I just decided to retrain as a personal trainer and my manager's support actually helped me leave the job, which she was devastated <laughs> with. But her support and her belief in me helped me make that decision. And I had no money to pay for the, the course, for the qualification. I didn't know what I was going to do after. That was the first ever loan I took in my life. I was shitting myself. But again, even something came through me at the time that when I sat in the bank speaking to the advisor, he said, you can get, I can't remember the, the numbers, but he, he said, you can get from that to that. So the top amount was a lot for me and I couldn't even and I didn't need that much I needed probably half of the the bracket that they gave me so I said you know I just need enough to pay for the training course and he said are you sure do you, you sure you don't want any extra and don't need any extra of course it's beneficial for them right <laughs> through interest but I just thought to myself you know what fuck it I'm just gonna take a couple of grand more and I'm gonna go away somewhere before I start the course. I don't know where it came from, but somewhere innately I knew I needed to look after myself. So that was my very first long haul holiday, actually. I went to Thailand before doing the training course, but that that was the, the start. Both Cliff and I met during that training course. We were a month apart in terms of when we started the, the training. It was a full on 12 week immersion. It was like proper going back to school and I loved it. It was amazing. So we did the personal training qualification first and very quickly after that, we started diving into nutrition because we both just wanted to help ourselves feel better first. And we had a couple of amazing nutrition tutors that were actually saying, this is what the curriculum says. This is what the government and the doctors will teach you. Fuck that. This is what you need to know. And this is what we're going to teach you which very often was the complete opposite. And I was just sitting there in classes going, fucking hell, everyone needs to know about this. So that's what really started it. And from the physical side, the fitness side and personal training to nutrition, to then 
going down the road of exploring so many different aspects of the medical world more for Cliff and for me going down the, the emotional route, the, the psychological route, and then more of the spiritual route as well, eventually over the 12 years that we've been together kind of brought us to this place. But it all started from the place of us both being screwed on, you know, one way or another and wanting to help ourselves. But because of that and the profound impact on our health and how different we felt, that's, I truly believe that's where the fuel and the passion came from to then go out to the world and actually help people in the way we were able to. So then you said you went more of the emotional and spiritual route as mm -hmm. you dove deeper into education. Why? What led you? And, and like, yeah, I have many questions, but what kind of got yeah, you of going course. down that route? We had no <clears throat> idea how to run a business, like zero clue. So we were really, really freaking good as personal trainers. And we were full with clients within a few months of starting work, work in that field and working ourselves down to the ground. A lot of people know <laughs> what the fitness world is like, right? Um, but we still, we loved it. But we got to a point about a couple of years after we graduated in 2000, we made a decision late 2010 and actually went traveling in 2011. We got to a point where we had so many clients and we were that busy that we either, that was our thinking at the time, uh, that we thought we either have to open up our own facility, our own gym or studio or, of some sort, or do something else because it was becoming too much and too overwhelming and not rewarding enough on the financial side working for other people, whether in the gym for Cliff or for me in a, in a little small personal studio, right? Private studio. Um, and I said to Cliff, you know what? My degree was originally in tourism and travel management. My degree was just a hobby. I love traveling. So I thought, screw it. I'm just going to do it as a degree. Never really worked in that field. Um, but I said to him, even my dissertation from a master's was about traveling the world and just the whole phenomenon of gap years. Like, why do people take gap years in the UK, in the US? Why at the time, years ago now, why no one takes them in Poland or Eastern Europe? So it was digging into that and exploring the reasons and why it started. Why do people do it? Why they don't do it? It was amazing. So I said to him, you know, I freaking planned my travel route around the world and I don't want to set up a business like a brick and mortar business, a physical premise to then in five years find myself so worked up in it that I can't separate myself from it. I didn't understand anything about business at the time. And I thought this is how it goes, right? That you become so engrossed. And for a lot of people, it does still happen that way, even though it doesn't have to. And I said, you know, I always wanted to travel. Do you want to go travel around the world with me? And he said, fucking hell, that's awesome. I never talked to anyone about it, but I really wanted to do that too. But I, I didn't want to do it on my own and none of my mates were interested. So fuck it, let's go. So we, we did, we, we went, we booked our tickets and it's interesting again, right? When you commit to something that your heart is really, truly aligned to, it, it, it just comes to you sometimes unexpectedly and sometimes often in disguise. Within a couple of months, I had my best month in personal training um, and made the most money. So I was able to put some money aside. I was able to buy the ticket. I was able to just do what I needed to do to make it happen. So over, over a few months period, we wrapped up everything. We passed on our clients to other people that we trusted and just buggered off for 11 months. And when we came back, and you would think that period of traveling would be that oh, spiritual moment for me. And it actually wasn't. It was amazing to rest, to travel, to explore so much, fall in love with so many places I've never been to. But when we came back, the reason why we came back, we lived in New Zealand, New Zealand at the time and absolutely loved it. But we had this idea, let's start a business online. That's 2012. So there's still not much online about it. There was like nothing like what you've got right now. We just had an idea. We thought it's possible. We've got internet. We can work with people remotely, but we have to come back to the UK to do it. Why? Go figure, right? <laughs> Ridiculous yeah, why? why would you do that? Exactly. <laughs> I don't know, but a divine intervention. We were meant to come back to the UK because that's where we met our original very first mentors because for about a year, we had no idea what we were doing. No idea. We were trying to do a little bit of stuff still face-to-face, -face, a little bit of online work, and 
we were just like blind leading the blind. And it was obviously painful emotionally as well because we had this idea, had no idea what to do with it. The clients weren't there, the money wasn't there. Oh, it was awful at points. But a friend of ours said, you know what? I've been working with these guys for a few months and I think you, you guys should see them. And the usual process, you go to a free seminar then they sell you on a three-day seminar. And then on the three-day seminar, they sell you a six or a 12-month program. So we, I don't want to say we fell into that trap because it was it was exactly what was meant to be at the time because it, it just completely shifted and transformed us. And even though they were talking about themselves as business and marketing mentors, it was heavily loaded with mindset work. And I didn't even go into any more like deeper emotional, spiritual work, just the outlook simple for me right now and you probably concept that if you have a belief of a perception, you're not stuck with it. You can change it. So I think it was the first or the second day of the three day seminar that we signed up to. Um, where the woman was explaining that the principle of a belief cycle, that you can break it, you can interfere with it, you can do something about it, and you can eventually acquire a new belief, a perception that's a lot more beneficial for you at the time, wherever you are in your life. Can I ask you for a personal example of one of these beliefs? Like kind of run me through what that cycle looked like of course. in one belief? Yeah, of course. So when I heard that, I thought, fucking hell. Like literally fucking hell, what am I doing? And that started the rabbit hole of going down the route of first mindset, then much deeper emotional, psychological, neuroscience, scientific stuff, spiritual stuff. It's just, it's never ending, right? So for me, one of the, the most profound, I'm just tapping in because there's two stories that want to come up. I'm asking which way to go. One was health related that I can't get healthy because I'm always gonna be sick and I didn't know why. And the other one was that <laughs> at that seminar, they also got us to calculate our perceived kind of what we think we can make in the next 12 months in the business. And as a result, we haven't even fully started working with them yet. We maybe had a couple of calls when we signed up to the, the 12 months mentoring. Within a month, we made more than what we thought we could make in a year. So that was more on the business side, the shift. Whoa. So, you know, like just knowing where it comes from and that it originates very often from your upbringing and your family, what you heard, what you saw, what you witnessed, what you sensed. A lot of people think it's words mostly, but as a child, we don't understand language. And especially in the first crucial years between when we born and the first five to seven years, we operate out of a very different space. It's almost like we're in a hypnotic state, right? So we're just taking everything on board. And whatever you see your parents or your guardians, whoever you're growing up with, do, their behaviors, their facial expressions, body language, you just take it as truth, right? And you hear it and see it and witness it and sense it repetitively. So you've got the repetition fact that that's the key foundational building block of a belief of a perception. It happens over time. Once you've witnessed something repetitively and as a child, you haven't got the ability, your prefrontal cortex isn't online until roughly when we're in our late, late 20s, early 30s, right? So think of all these years, what's going on in there? <laughs> it's a shitstorm for majority of us, unfortunately, right? But then it depends what we choose to do with it. It can be the most nourishing and nurturing shitstorm as well. But we can get into that later. So you've got that repetition factor and we haven't got the ability to interpret the context of it. So if mom does something this way or if dad talks about money or health in that way or if they're getting attention in a certain way, oh, I've got a headache, oh, my arm hurts or this or that. If you see that constantly, inevitably you adopt these patterns yourself and you repeat them without knowing. You don't know that you're reaching out for love and connection by pulling a face and slightly exaggerating how sick you're feeling. That was me. My entire family would seek attention through how sick and unwell they have been feeling all their lives. Like my grandma, my dad's mom, I, from the moment I started remembering and she died in my mid twenties. So it would have been probably about 20 years. She was dying for the 20 years. Oh, this hurts, or that hurts, oh, I'm dying, oh, I'm not well. That was constantly going on. And obviously my dad being her son, guess what, right? That was the same story. And 
you've got the repetition factor. And of course, you look up to these people. They're your mum and dad. They're your grandma and granddad. They're the people that you spend time with. So, of course, at the beginning, most of us think they know everything, right? And then you get to that rebellious teenage period where you're like, you know shit, I know better. <laughs> and then you get into a period where you actually realize how much they can learn from you now and the roles reverse. Um, so you've got the authority factor as well. they the authority. So, of course, we take it on board. And then we've got also confidence where, like, if they tell you something, do it this way or do it that way. They being confident because they think they want to teach you something. And then if you think about it, take it to a wider society, governments, police, army, doctors, teachers, they're all in that position of authority. And we very often perceive that because they're in the position of authority because of the uniform or position in their, the job that they're filling is just... Like, of course, they're going to be confident in our eyes in what they're saying. Sometimes people can see through the lack of confidence or another, but most of the time, well, if this person has been educated and trained to do this, well, I, I better listen, right? So we've got, it's like a soup. I always say it's like a soup and it's cooking and we've got all those ingredients and then we turn out to be seeking love and connection through feeling unwell or constantly connecting to scarcity and the fact that making money is difficult. How many of us were told that money doesn't grow on trees or who do you think I am, a millionaire and things like that. Unfortunately, most of us would have heard these stories rather than something different, right? That could be much more empowering or encouraging. And there is a period of the frustration where you're thinking, well, why the fuck is this happening? You should have taught me better. But for those of us that can get through this and see through this, we understand that it's our responsibility and it's only us who can break the cycle and shift and change it. And how do we change it, right? The same way it started. We can't fix, I can't remember if it's Einstein's quote or somebody else's that we can't fix the problem with the same thinking that created it. But the recipe really is the same. So you bring in the repetition factor, but of something that you want and now choose instead. You get to get a source of authority and confidence. And my outcome, my ideal outcome for clients is when they become an authority to themselves and start really, truly trusting in the fact that they are able to change their perceptions and their lives, right? But at the beginning, they might need to borrow it from me. And it's okay because that's what I'm there for. That's my job. I don't want them to put me on the pedestal because that's unhealthy because I'm just like them. I'm a human being. I fuck shit up sometimes as well. But I also learn and I can give them a different perspective. That's really what it is. I'm a mirror. I'm offering a different perspective through whatever modality I choose to use. But it's then still down to them to take that, that decision, take that step. So when they build up the confidence within themselves and create that authority from within, they can borrow it from someone like yourself, from someone like Cliff, from other people that they trust, right? That they know that maybe are a couple of steps ahead of them or have been through what they've been through and they can give them a different perspective. So that's how you, I don't even like um, using the word break it. That's how you rewire it, right? We often talk about neuroplasticity and how our brain works, that we can rewire our perceptions. So that's how you do it. That's just the start because obviously then we've got the deeper spiritual and emotional attachments and connections. But the essence of it, that's how it started for me when I understood that there is an entry point through to that cycle when we attach a meaning to something that we've seen or heard or witnessed as a kid and we can change that meaning. Mind, blow. You know, the mind blow and emoji with the brain like splashing out of its head. That's that was me. That was yeah. me. And I thought, why, why are we not being taught that shit at school, right? <laughs> so, and that's how I started. Hand on heart, I started with a, like a printing paper, A4 piece of paper and a Sharpie pen and a marker pen. And I would speak to every single client because Cliff and I physiologically used to do the same, like mo mostly gut work to start with. We were known like the, as the gut people in the UK first before learning a lot more about the, the deeper aspects of physiology and the cellular health and all of that stuff. So we were doing the same stuff. We were very much engrossed in the physical stuff. But when I learned about that, that there is an entry point in that belief cycle, literally started talking to every client, every single next goal that I had with a client after that event and that realization, I would tell them, you sit there, I draw, tell me if you understand, let's run through it together. That's going to change everything you'd been doing with us and make it so much easier. 
So that was amazing. And then I started creating materials and structure to the, the programs. I was taking them through a structured approach and staggering different things and then going deeper and deeper into concepts and aspects. And then 2016, I just, from another mentor, um, I heard this thing about just going with the flow and trusting yourself. Like when you asked before this for a list of subjects and topics to cover, I have no fucking idea what's going to come up. Let's just roll with it. And I love it. And when I actually learned that, when I embraced that, we stopped preparing for any of our speaking gigs. We stopped preparing for, like, I stopped preparing for calls. With Cliff, it's a bit different. When he runs through testing, interpretations, protocols, there has to be a little bit more structure. But that's a perfect play of the structure and the beautiful divine chaos that I bring in. And it's just like, again, and that's that's the result of it. So a long story but that's that's how it all began and it just evolved from there and it keeps going deeper and deeper so what does the process look like or what did it look like for you for instance with the income belief so you worked with these mentors and i'm sure you've gone so much further down this road now yeah. but what was the big what or could you explain the process of you know, working really hard, like you said, grinding yourself down, doing mm -hmm. all these clients, and then having one month where you made what you would make in a year before. Yeah. What, what was the thing that happened there? Yeah. What's that process? Like if someone were to do this right now alongside us, like what does that look like? What's the process? Yeah. For us personally, again, and it's always a mixture. It's never just a one thing, right? But you got to start somewhere. And the entry point for us to that belief cycle was to first understand that we didn't know what we didn't know. We thought we were going to make, I think it was 24,000 pounds in a year maximum with the current prices that we had, with how many clients we believe we could bring in. And I think we did like 26 in that first month with working with these guys, right? So it was just understanding that it doesn't have to be that way from more of the mindset perspective that we learned this from somewhere, but also then understanding simple structures of a program putting shit together and packaging it like that was very like down to earth marketing and presenting a product to a client way but i'm going to go a little bit further with that because i think that will be much more uh, relevant to what we're talking about for me personally it wasn't even maybe about grinding hard and hustling hard to make money it was more from the perspective of money doesn't come to people like us or we just don't have money and the people that do have money, they just either bad people or they scammers and they, you know, do weird shit to, to make money or whatever, like all sorts of stuff like that. So that was more of what I unfortunately grew up with or maybe fortunately because it allowed me to then do the work and shift it. So the work for me was literally to understand that this is only my perception that it's hard to make money or money doesn't come to me or someone like me cannot make money. So there was all sorts of different um, elements involved and they kind of unravel as you follow the rope and go through through the process of exploring. When I understood that it doesn't have to be that way, well, if it doesn't have to be that way, what what's the, the opposite? What can be on the other side? And this is a very vulnerable point for a lot of people because you you get to take responsibility regardless of what's going on. You have to stop pointing your finger and saying, I'm poor and haven't got money and I'm using my own story because I'm from a family that wasn't well off or because I'm from an Eastern European country and no one has any money, which is bullshit because one of the stories about people that have money was about some of my mum and dad's friends or acquaintances from school that did really well for themselves and they were the new money right and that was very derogatory in a sense that oh it's good for them it's okay for them or they were lucky or they cheated or did something dodgy so all of, I had to handle all of that stuff in order for me to even be able to to become a steward of, of the money that we were making to even embrace the concept of fucking hell, I thought I was going to make maximum of 24 grand in a year and I made 26 in the first month. What do I do with this? So it was just like, there you go. That's a different possibility just by simply changing our programs and speaking about it differently and learning to trust ourselves and how much we know about what we do as well and presenting it to potential clients. 
Of course, people respond very differently to that energy, right? So new people signed up at very different prices, very different programs. But then what do you do with this? The money's here now that you've never thought you'd be able to do to make in a month. What do you do with that? And that's where everything I just said I'm from Eastern Europe, I'm from a family that doesn't have money. We never did. I don't know how to do this. Or, you know, you can't have money because you perceived a dodgy person that does like, you know, shady shit and stuff like that. So it's it's been unraveling itself over the years. And there's there's um you know, like levels in the game, like eh, you just got to this level. So it's like that where you're exploring and just the ability to to even comprehend that money isn't bad. That in fact it gives you options. It doesn't make you happy, but it gives you options, for example, that you can choose what to do with it and you can do a hell of a lot of good. Like I remember the day crying my eyes out when we were able to donate ten thousand pounds to a school in Colombia that we support for them to buy pool heaters for the kids because they managed to build a pool in the school for swimming lessons, but they couldn't heat it. And it was mm. freezing in there and when we actually arrived to visit the school and we couldn't do it for the last two years unfortunately because of everything going on in the world but we go every year when we were able to see a group of kiddos having a swimming lesson in a warm pool and then they just all stopped at some point the principal came in and they're all loving he's like an uncle to them and he just stopped the class and he just said you know these are the guys that made this possible. That's why the water is warm because they helped us and all of that stuff. And we had our clients with us that were, some of them donated as well. And um, it was just amazing. The kids all started singing the uh, school anthem in English for us and then just ran out of the water, gave us hugs and stuff. It was just amazing. So, you know, like, it's fucking awesome to have a lot of money. It is amazing because you can do epic shit like that, but you can also then learn to appreciate the fact that you can do what you want in your life as well and it's okay i had to learn it's okay to have a nice pair of shoes not because i want to show off to someone and make myself look better in their eyes in my perception it might not be like that in their eyes at all but purely because i want a freaking nice pair of shoes that looks really fucking cool with these jeans that i've got and this jacket and i'm gonna put my lipstick on i'm gonna have an amazing date night with cliff It doesn't fucking matter if I go in my joggers or in those shoes. But in this moment, it matters because I feel awesome wearing it. So just being able to embrace that or flying business or first for the purpose of the fact that this has to be fresh when we land and attend an event that we're speaking at. If that's not fresh, if we had a shit flight, didn't sleep, we're not going to perform as well. So appreciate that, that it's not to show to people that look at me, I've got this money, I can fly business or first. It's to appreciate yourself more and to be able to honor yourself enough that you choose to invest. It's an investment in you. So to be able to do that or work with mentors to continue our growth. And it's been an amazing journey so far and it just continues, right? There's, there's always more to explore. But to be able to to see myself go through these different levels using the same work that I use with clients on myself, ah, it's been amazing. Wow. So what's your what's your favorite like exercise or process that you bring people through lately, like in the last year? Really, truly, probably one of the the most favorite in the last year. Since I started in the last two to three years, I started working with hypnosis a lot more. Because I've been, the way Cliff and I work to pre-frame that, we don't follow one principle or one approach. It's a blend of everything we've learned and we made it our own. So you'll see bits and aspects of work of so many different people in what we do and it's it's our approach to to things so it is very individual um depending on where the client is and what intuitively because i work very intuitively what comes through me as an idea for them but other than taking them through their own personal hypnotherapy sessions and just exploring the most incredible concepts sometimes it's helping them teach stuff that they can do themselves so, you know, things like, I'm actually going to put the light on because I realized I went all grainy. Is that all right? I yeah, think yeah. So. Um, it's helping them 
do things that they can do themselves when they don't speak to me so they understand that it all comes from within so different simple versions of self-hypnosis for example and I love the mentor that I learned hypnosis from she describes hypnosis as meditation with a goal because a lot of the time people are afraid of hypno work and they freak out because they think it's mind control and have you got a story because you're laughing no no I just think it's hilarious <laughs> that they said meditation right? with a goal and I'm like oh that's yeah. a really it's a really it profound cool. way of saying that right because if you think about it there is a purpose to hypnosis. You're working with hypnotherapy in order to achieve a certain objective. You know, a lot of people associate hypnotherapy with smoking and, and stopping smoking or binge eating or something like that. And you can very much use it for that. But there's so much more to it. You're basically able to communicate because all the stories and perceptions that we're talking about, they're not in our conscious mind. They live deeply buried in our subconscious. And we just... 90 to 95 percent of the time we operate out of our subconscious on autopilot but it's knowing and trusting that everything that goes on is happening in order to help us and to protect us to keep us safe i always talk about the illogical logic right every interview every podcast any anything that i do it always comes down to the principles of how the beliefs and perceptions are being created where they live and the, the concept of illogical logic so for me at the time where I believed I needed to seek out love through feeling unwell or that I couldn't have money in my life because it was bad or it didn't happen to people like me, my subconscious mind was using those patterns and beliefs to protect me, to keep me connected to my tribe, to my family, to go in line with those beliefs because I've learned it from people that are supposed to be the authorities. So why would I go against them and make them wrong? All sorts of stuff like that is, is present. So on the outside, it seems illogical to exaggerate your health symptoms to get someone's attention. But when you understand why you're doing it, it's perfectly logical. It makes so much sense. So helping people embrace that through that meditation with a goal, the way hypnosis works, works you're able to access your subconscious directly very often so you're able to communicate with those illogically logical parts of you that we can't access this way just consciously speaking like we are right now it's a different brain state different brain waves so doing that in one-to-one -one sessions with them is one aspect but then teaching them a version of a self-hypnosis for whatever purpose they want to use it for it's just amazing and that's probably something that i love and adore doing and especially wow. recently, because it's very personal and, and I can change it and adapt it and guide them in whatever direction they need to go. Yeah. What does that look like? Like, what does a self hypnosis look like from your mm -hmm. combined, you know, uh, magical chaos, as you describe it? I love that magical chaos. I actually, did I say that? I did say that, right? You said something, <laughs> something, something like divine lines. chaos or yes, something like that. Yeah. I think that's what it was. I actually need to use that more because I, I think I said it for the first time, but it's such a perfect expression to, of it. So um, thank you for bringing that up. So what does that look like? I actually do have a few recordings um, that I, I did for clients. And one of our clients is actually playing with music as well. And he was a producer and he is a producer. Um, so he created music to put in the background. So it made it like really nice and cool and relaxing. So I can send them that. I can um, ask them to, to listen to when they, when they feel drawn to, um, to doing so. So to help them go to sleep, to help them organize their mind if it's all messy, when they're struggling with you know, to-do lists and things like that. But then it could go so far deeper into physically healing their body when we're working on the deeper physiological issues. So you can do that as well. But it's really, truly, first of all, is is understanding that it's okay to allow ourselves that, that pause moment because we're all so busy and so wrapped up in everything that's going on that very often people think, how can I spend even 10 minutes doing this? if I've got all these things to do. So helping them first understand that it's okay, it's safe, it's okay, and it's in fact beneficial. Because if they, let's say, have in their eyes two hours worth of work to do or two hours of looking after the kids and they're freaking out about that, if they do 10 minutes, even five minutes, there is a version of self-hypnosis that could be 30 seconds, literally, that just resets them 
and it opens wow. okay. more Let's space do and that. capacity. What, is that? what is yeah. that? Let's do that right now. What's the 30 second okay. self-hypnosis? I'll do a slightly longer one just so it feels <laughs> even nicer. So, you know, we are nice and chilled right now and it's, it's really good. And I love that again, that comes from my mentor that I learned from. So I get to give credits, but it's so powerful to help people become aware of the state they're in right now. So just a simple, you know, one to 10 scale. Like if you were to say, you're probably very chilled relatively right now because we're talking, having a good time, but just overall stress level, or, or even not a stress level, but just wakefulness and awareness. Like, you know, I feel really like, rah, like I know my adrenaline is pumping right now. So I'm not like, yeah, chilling on the beach. I'm not there right now, but it feels really good and engaging. So zero would be as chilled as you possibly can be. And 10 will be having a panic attack and thinking you need to go to a fucking hospital right now because you're going to die. Where would you say you are on the zero, on the one to 10? Like a three. Okay, three. Cool. Awesome. So it's pretty chill. But if let's say you wanted to chill a little bit more, and in fact, anyone watching or listening can do that with us. What I'd love for you to do is to, first of all, oh, you've already closed your eyes. You know what we're doing, right? So yeah, close your eyes. <laughs> and just take a nice deep, long breath in filling up your belly your chest and just hold it on top for a second and then just breathe it out sigh it out that's it then just arrive in your chair and your seat feeling your body right here right now and what i'd like you to do is to imagine a color that you love right over the top of your head it's starting to form in a little cloud or a little bubble Maybe it's still, maybe it's swirling around. Whatever you see or think about, or visualize or feel, is just perfect. And when you've got that color, let me know what it is. Yellow. Yellow. So imagining that yellow flowing gently through the top of your head and all the way down through your body, through your chest, your stomach, down your arms through your hips and legs and all the way down and out through the bottoms of your feet. And in just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to count down from five to one really slowly. You'll do it out loud. And after every number, you'll repeat, I am relaxing deeper and deeper. So it will sound like this. Five, I'm relaxing deeper and deeper. Four, I'm relaxing deeper and deeper and so on. So five, two, one, go ahead and start now. Five, I'm relaxing deeper and deeper. Four, I'm relaxing deeper and deeper. Three, I'm relaxing deeper and deeper. Two, I'm relaxing deeper and deeper one i'm relaxing deeper and deeper that's it and imagine that yellow flowing in through the top of your head again and all the way down through your body and out the bottoms of your feet into the center of the earth and you can even see feel or imagine gentle roots growing out of the bottoms of your feet as that color flows out Grounding you, releasing and relaxing you even deeper. And now I'd like you to repeat a very powerful statement and very true statement three times out loud. And it goes like this. I am calm. I am safe. And I choose to be here. I am calm. I am safe. And I choose to be here. Go ahead and repeat it out loud three times. I am calm, I am safe, and I choose to be here. I am calm, I am safe, and I choose to be here. I am calm, I am safe, and I choose to be here. That's it. And imagining that yellow flowing in through the top of your head again and gently making its way all the way down through your body and out through the bottoms of your feet. And now take a moment to really feel how much more relaxed, 
calm and peaceful you're beginning to feel already. And how much more of that calm, peace, relaxation you're creating in your life from now on forward for as long as you choose. And when you feel complete, just put a gentle smile on your lips so I know that you're done. That's right. And one more time, imagining that yellow flowing in through the top of your head and all the way down through your body, sealing in and integrating that beautiful, relaxed, calm and peaceful feeling. Taking a deep, long breath in once again. And whenever you're ready, gently, putting a smile on your lips and fluttering your eyes open. <laughs> so now, knowing that at the start you were at three out of ten, where do you feel you are right now? I'm on the beach. I'm on the beach chilling. <laughs> <laughs> this is how powerful it is. And obviously this was a slightly longer version, but... Even if we have literally, even if we know we're about to run through the door coming from work or running in from a business meeting or whatever it might be, and we know our kids are there or our partner is there and we all agitated, we can stop just outside our front door, close our eyes and go, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm calm, I choose to be here see the color of feel. Some people will see it because they're very visual. Sometimes you can just think about the color running through your pocket through your body you can feel it so whatever that method is of your preference whatever comes and whatever show it shows up as just go with that as an as something that you can do so easily and so calmly yeah. and i feel like wow there are so many days where maybe i don't take four minutes to Literally. get into that state yeah and like you feel how much your body like really calms down and you're like wow if you did that like twice a day Imagine the power of that, right? And you can literally, the beauty of it and the fact that what I love about it the most probably is that you can literally use it for anything because you can use it for simply like what we, I don't know how much um, we got recorded on the previous recording um, until Zoom decided that it's had enough. <laughs> Where I was saying, you know, you can literally, before you step through, the door or before you're about to react to someone's comment or whatever where you know it can lead to an argue, argument or you saying shit that you don't want to say whatever you can literally just close your eyes and go physically feel the color see the color going through your body to calm you down count from three to one even it doesn't have to be five to one or ten to one or fifteen to one right you can say, I am safe, I am calm, I choose to be here, or anything that brings you to the present moment. I've been recently doing um, another process uh, where you're retraining your limbic system and reteaching your body to feel safe again and, and recognize what's safe, what's real threat, like a tiger or a bus about to run you over because you're not paying attention, rather than, I don't know, me eating soup or something like that right so you can bring yourself i am here now in this moment i am here now in my body so whatever resonates but the reason why it's set out that way i am safe you're telling your nervous system and your brain that you're safe that it's okay to be here right i choose to be here the third part i am calm it's all commands and signals to your brain and to your subconscious mind that responds to to our state and it responds with the reaction, right? Or responds, react versus respond. React is reenact your old shit or respond from where you are right now. Choose your response consciously. Give yourself a moment by calming down your nervous system, telling your subconscious mind it's okay to be here. And then you go through whatever it is that you want to go through, right? With the response to someone or whatever it might be that you're facing in that moment. So you can use it for that, but you can use it, like, for example, what I do in terms of helping people regain their health and restore their health, whatever it is that they're going through physically, whatever Cliff is working with them on physiologically, I help them do it from the 
nervous system perspective, from the mind perspective, from the more psychological aspect, whatever the brain is doing, whatever the mind is doing, how they're working together, how the body responds to it. And you can guide them in the recording that I've got for clients, you're physically going through a period where I remain silent and they can do what they want to do with that time. So they can either visualize being already in that meditative hypnotic state, they can visualize what it feels like to be getting healthier. And that's then modulating that as well, because if someone visualizes, and I often talk about that as well. So for example, someone's really unwell, chronically ill, and they want to be healthy, fully healthy. They have maybe a recognition of that from before they got sick. They remember what it's like to be full of vitality and energy and to be doing awesome stuff and just to be able to do stuff. Because a lot of the people that we work with are severely limited in what they can do from the brain capacity to the physical body capacity movement and things like that so if they have a recollection of that the tendency is to want to run straight to that or for people that maybe most of their lives have been unwell but they have that vision of what health means to them and looks like to them they want to go straight for that but that your body and your mind might not be ready for that so going straight for that but feeling that inner urge to either run off from that vision run away from that or you hear either a chatter at the back of your mind or a physical symptom in your body that, nah, that's not okay. It's either not possible, I can't get there, whatever the conversation that might be in our head. There's no point going there because what you're really doing, and that's how a lot of people work with affirmations, visualizations, unfortunately, because they don't understand how your mind and your brain respond to those visions where they treat that vision of the future healthy you, for example, or wealthy, healthy, in love, in a beautiful relationship, in a certain country, in a certain job position, certain level of business success, your mind and brain, as they work together in that recognition of who that version is, if it's too far-fetched, they're going to label it as a stranger. And what do we do? And again, what are we taught, right, from the very early stages in our lives? Be mindful, be wary, be aware, be careful, don't trust strangers, don't talk to strangers. How would your scared, already unwell body and mind would want to be acquainted to that healthy version of you that's a stranger? That's not going to happen. So we very often and easily can affirm the unwell and unhealthy. I'm using that as an example because of what we do, right? But any aspect, unwealthy, unhealthy, unlovable, whatever it is that we believe, we can reaffirm that. Often, And that's why people often say affirmations don't work, meditation is bullshit, hypnosis is bullshit. But really, truly, when you understand how to titrate that and how to modulate that, how to formulate a vision that you sit with in that hypnotic state, in that period that I'm silent, what is the stuff that you want to repeat to yourself? Because you can repeat an affirmation of some sort. You can see a vision. You can just spend, like I said to you, just really soak it up and sit in that state for a moment and put a smile on your face when you've when you've completed that person when you feel like yeah I'm, I'm done i'm ready let's move on whatever the next step is if we're going through a hypnosis session that's longer we can continue exploring but here it was embodying that relaxation and how quickly you can go from number three to the beach somewhere without really doing much but just breathing slowing down like doing less is more in this this context so in that space you can fill it in with whatever you want and you can direct that process into any area of your life anything that you're working on focusing on doing and and want to improve or change and that's that's the beautiful thing and that's what i absolutely love doing because it's so when someone embraces that process it's just so empowering is it more powerful to like hear a recording of these things or like what's the ratio that i should be speaking mm -hmm. uh to myself yeah. once i'm in that calm state versus hearing things mm -hmm. in that calm state i'm pretty sure there's going to be some physical research done on it but i'm not aware of it so i'm not gonna bullshit you with made up numbers genuinely it really is individual because some people for example if someone is at that stage of building up that authority and confidence within themselves it might be more powerful and useful to hear my voice if they trust me if they believe in the power of the work that we're doing together it's going to be soothing it's going to be relaxing it's going to feel even more safe for them to say they feel safe right 
So that might be at this stage, it might be more powerful for them to listen to the recording. At some point, they might feel it might feel really empowering for them to actually really do it themselves and go through the process, remember the steps and maybe even shift and change it and adapt it to what they feel when they feel like, oh, I, that's what I feel like doing and I'm going to trust that feeling. I'm not going to repeat anything right now. I'm just going to sit in silence or I'm going to visualize this today so rather than doing that. That's when you get to that point where you trust yourself more and more in the fact that it comes from within and you see it. You might not need the recording. Sometimes for me, for example, I sit in silence. Sometimes I listen to my own recording. Sometimes I listen to somebody else's. It depends on what's going on in my body. I know we've been going for a while, and I, but I just have a yeah, couple more course, questions that course. are like, I feel like I need to get answered. Yeah. What is the process for someone going from they're currently not their own authority figure to becoming the authority figure that you keep saying? How do they go from, yeah. from there to there? I love how um, you're asking me in so many questions for a system or a process or, you know, from here to there. <laughs> I don't know. I do and I don't, right? Because it's it's literally tuning in to the person, to their situation. Are they, Where is their nervous system, for example, at the beginning of our journey together? Because very often... For certain people, they would have done this work. They would have worked on their body, on their health, emotional and physical. And this is the next stage for them in that exploration. Their start point with me is different because I can only ever interpret from here to there within the window of what we're doing together. Of course, we know what they've done before and we talk to the clients about who they worked with, what they what they did, how it worked, where they find themselves right now, their story, all of that, right? It's important. But where they start with me, it's always going to be very different for different people. Um, and then what do they respond to? So where their nervous system is, like I started, for example, is it aware of what it what's safe, what's unsafe in a, I don't want to use the word rational way, because it's always rational. It doesn't matter if it's something that's been dropped on the floor behind you and it makes you jump, or if it's like a physical tiger running after you and you need to run. It's very rational for the nervous system and for the mind in the moment, but in the sense of like a day-to-day -day life, do you think it's necessary for your body to do this and jump when someone dropped a pen behind you, for example, right? Or could it be like, oh, someone dropped a pen? So where is the nervous system in terms of that recognition of safety and threat? So where do we get to start? Do we get to go really easily and slowly first to help the body and the mind feel safe? Or are they at that stage already in their evolution? And we can start exploring deeper context, whether it is certain patterns and beliefs, behaviors from childhood that are not helping them get to where they want to get to right now? Is it something in their immediate environment that we need to deal with? Because you always get to consider the outside world, like our eyes can't see, but can't see themselves. They can see the outside world, but can't see themselves unless there is a physical mirror in front. The world is like a giant projector screen. I think it was Jason Silva that said that in one of their one of his videos years ago. And I was like, fuck, this is like such an accurate description. They like projectors and everything around us is a projector screen. So can we use that as input into what's actually going on? Is the person ready to embrace that? Because we need to look within but also without, outside, and know that always helps us and guides, guides us. If we're not sure what's going on here, we get to look out there because it will tell us through different, how we respond, how, to, how we react to certain situations, circumstances, right? What's going on? But overall, really starting, and I'm learning this more and more and more as I follow more of the neuroscientific and neurological um path in in my exploration if our nervous system is stuck in threat you know the polyvagal theory deb dana stephen porges all of their work stephen porges is the creator of polyvagal theory but the dana translates it into stuff that we can understand like you and i without being in the lab um in a white coat I, it might be overwhelming to and might be too much to attempt to read stephen porges's polyvagal theory book because it's like a textbook right it's fascinating again you and i would geek out on it but again 
it's still probably nothing comparing to like his mates that he talks to when they do the physical research, right? So Deb Dana is someone who beautifully translates it into day-to-day -day language. So if our bodies are stuck in threat in the dorsal um, vagal, part of our vagus nerve we can go down the rabbit hole there as well but that will take us probably another couple of hours so if most of the time we're stuck there it's going to be impossible to make anything that cliff or i do in our programs and the work together with clients stick if you like and give them a long-term result and that's very often i've I've experienced this myself. Cliff has experienced this himself. You might have experienced it yourself as well. A lot of us that that dive into self-evolution, growth, development in any aspect, whether health, again, wealth, business, career, doesn't matter, any aspect of our lives, we do different things. We practice different modalities. We go to different therapists or whatever it is that we use and it, it works and it changes but we still find ourselves stuck in loops sometimes, right? Or we might feel like when we stop, and you, I know you've experienced that with your guys as one of the people that you work with, when you leave, their symptoms come back. So rewind it back to the basics from Cliff's perspective when it comes to realigning and rebalancing their physiology, it starts with the cell, right? The cell creates a tissue, tissue creates an organ, organs create a system and the systems create us as a human being. So we get to start with the cell. From my perspective, we get to start with the nervous system because if we can't feel safe, we're gonna go nowhere. We can dial down the symptoms, we can make someone, well not make someone, help someone feel better, but it's not gonna last because it can't because it's physically constantly going round in circles. It's like that from the somatics per perspective and point of view, it's a charge in the nervous system that got stuck in the loop through some sort of a traumatic experience. And if it keeps running in circles and we can't find a safe space to discharge it and let that loop to complete itself, it doesn't matter what we do, it's just not gonna last. It can bring you relief, but it won't stay. So starting there, definitely, and then just exploring. There's so many modalities, so many approaches, so many concepts that you can use right now that the world is your oyster. Follow the path, whoever you're drawn to, whatever approach you're drawn to. But really, truly starting with that, that primal aspect of us where we learn, relearn very often to determine what's safe what's not and what is a threat and what's not that's crucial and i'll give you a real example that we experienced on the friday i was doing um a training for our mentorship where we teach wellness professionals um basically what we do and and why we do it the way we do it and why we get the results we do with clients um i was doing an amazing guest expert training with a nervous system expert and someone who teaches that stuff, which focuses on retraining the limbic system, focusing on cultivating primal trust within us, knowing that we heal from within. Yes, people assist us and guide us to become that authority for ourselves, but it has to start from within, right? So when she was taking um, the guys that were on the training live through a simple exercise of helping uh, in, to improve blood flow, even that, it's that simple, to improve blood flow to our brainstem, so we can do its job better. One of uh, the girls on the training, when she was doing that, she said it physically in the chat box on Zoom, it physically is making me feel sick doing that simple exercise. And it just involved functional neurology, just involved eye movement and holding your gaze to one side and then to, and, uh, to the other and, and breathing and stuff like that um, to just in, improve blood flow to your brainstem. And that was physically making her feel sick. So. But for someone else, and you needed to get to a point of the vagus nerve activating and realizing, okay, we can calm down, it's okay, it's safe, where you either sigh or you yawn. And I yawned probably within a minute of looking one way and the other. For that person, she felt physically sick starting the exercise. She couldn't really complete the time that we were doing it, the time frame. For somebody else, maybe they yawned earlier, maybe they didn't, but they felt okay doing that, you know? And for certain people, apparently it can take a week or two to even get to that point where the brain realizes we can relax and do that, right? <laughs> Talking about yawning. And you yawn when you drop in like, oh, I'm okay, I'm safe. So um, it's very intriguing and interesting to, and I, I love developing systems and processes and paths for people to walk down. But the moment I dropped into the fact of how individual it is for everybody 
And yes, we get to go from the safety recreation and re-remembering, right? To then whatever it is that we explore uh, or from the, the cell level, like for what Cliff is doing, um, the starting point for different people will be different. I just love how you ask a seemingly simple, short, one sentence question and I go on for 20 minutes answering that. <laughs> That's how I work. <laughs> and that, I love how detailed these answers are. I love the combination of like, you're giving me so much of that like chaos information and energy of like you're really surrounding me with examples and ideas and uh examples and ideas and giving little bits of structure throughout mm -hmm. your answers where i'm like oh okay i could see this so uh, my my question for you is when people fall in love with you and are obsessed with all of the things that you've been saying, like where can they go to learn more <laughs> or contact you if that's something that they can do? Like where where can people get more of yeah, you? Yeah, of course. And, and this is the thing. You would think like um, the stuff that we do, right, with people that everybody's going to know about it and we're going to have hundreds of thousands of, if not millions of followers. Through my own personal journey, I realized that this is not for me. I do not want to dilute my message. I love this. Like you and I, or a small group of people, whether it's a retreat or we bring people uh, to an event, you know, like the last two years have been tough for us because we just couldn't do that stuff and we love it. Um, and you know, like there won't be, like, of course we do have Instagram, we do have a Facebook page, we do have a website that, that looks cool. I like the colors, but it's not really, um, you learn about our story, obviously, about us tab, and you've got the blog, and you've got the shit that you got to have there. But really, truly, if someone is is drawn towards me, just message me personally. Let's have a conversation. I'm on Facebook. On Instagram, it says Cliff and Marta as our handle, but Cliff is not even logged in. He asked someone to post a picture in the comments on Instagram once, and I'm like, dude, you know that you can't do it on here. He's like, oh, I had no idea. <laughs> so, you know, if, if someone's drawn to, I really, truly prefer to just connect and reach out through the social media platforms, probably the easiest to start with, and just see where it takes us. Again, you can go onto the website, cliffandmarta.com and have a little read there. But we've never gone down the route of any, at any point where we wanted to work with someone to help us structure a message more from that beautiful divine chaos into narrowing it down. Everyone would tell us to niche down. Everyone would tell us to create an avatar. And every time we heard it, we were just like, Ugh! puking emoji. Right, I love speaking in emojis. So it was just awful. And I, and there's nothing wrong with it. It works for certain people. But through the work that we do, we've helped women get pregnant that couldn't get pregnant after six failed IVF cycles. And that specific person I'm talking about is a PhD in reproductive fucking biology and had issues, couldn't get pregnant. You know, going to specialists in her country, in the world, Husband is a surgeon and they struggled. Within six months working with us, she's pregnant and her baby girl, I think is six or seven years old now. So we've had several, like Cliff and I chose not to have children other than a very little child, right? A, a dog, but we've helped people. So we, we always say that we've got like seven or eight Cliff and Marta babies running around the world. So, but we're not fertility experts. We understand how the human body works. We worked with people with chronic diseases, with several autoimmune diseases, from the autoimmunity of the gut, of the brain, thyroid, whatever else it might be. We worked people with some mysterious things that didn't have a name because no doctor could label it to give them a relief of like, this is wrong with you, go and do that. So, you know, so many people came to us after 10, 15, 20 years of looking for answers. Um, we, we can't niche down. We don't have an avatar. An avatar for us is someone who has no answers and wants to find answers. And, you know, even people, you don't have to be fucked like we were to benefit from this work. But unfortunately, a lot of the time we get to get to that point where we feel there's no, no return to, to find us. That's how, unfortunately, people often find us and very often through word of mouth or referrals from previous clients. Um, but you don't have to be at that point. I'm working with a beautiful human being right now who lost her husband last year. 
and she's in that transition right now. And I'm not a grief counselor. I'm not, but she trusts me. She loves the work that we've done together before. And she did work with us on her health. And she asked me if I would assist her in that transition from being a devoted wife and teaching people about relationships and how her being almost 60 years old now created this powerful relationship, this beautiful family, children, all of that, to now going, I'm not a wife anymore. I get to transition into a different version of me and how do I do that, right? So I work with someone like that, for example. So yeah, just have a conversation. Reach out, have a conversation, watch this, see if you like me, if you don't like me, you know, that's the beauty of it. You could have 10 people saying the same stuff, like lined up on stage and every single person in the crowd will be drawn to a different person. And that's what I also love and, and adore about working with people that there is that initial connection because I've got this problem and I trust you can help me because I, my friend worked with you and they had a, a tremendous success, whatever it might be, or I've read this, the blog or whatever, or the post, and I resonated with it. And people think, again, that logic, right? Because of this, I think that's why you can help me and I'd like to work with you. That's the entry point. We then start really unraveling and you see what the little invisible threads of connection are. Very often you understand that there's so much more to why you're attracted to this specific person in order to assist you rather than this person, even though their message might be similar. I'm still out here and I'm still moving along, still wondering. I'm still at it, I'm still keeping on, still wondering. I